Tonight on the Daily Debrief, Texas jurors decide the fate of a man they previously convicted of murdering a young dentist, all because of her new boyfriend. Plus, this child found dead and infested with maggots. His father faces murder charges, but his defense points the finger back at the authorities. And charges are piling up against the man accused of mass murder at a Jewish synagogue. That's straight ahead on the Daily Debrief for Wednesday, October 31st. And good evening, everybody. Welcome to The Daily Debrief. A Texas jury less than an hour ago sent a convicted murderer to death row. Dallas area dentist Kendra Hatcher died in what prosecutors described as an execution-style shooting in September 2015. Authorities say Hatcher was dating this man, Ricardo Padiagua. The problem was his jealous ex-girlfriend, Brenda Delgado. Authorities believe she was the mastermind who hired the defendant, Christopher Love, to rob and kill Kendra Hatcher. Jurors convicted Love last week, and today they handed down his punishment. Another woman, Crystal Cortez, admitted to being the getaway driver. She testified against love. After the verdict, the victim's mother gave one of the most powerful victim impact statements we have ever seen. I can only imagine how hard this has been for you to be away from your family. And here it is, a holiday, and those of you with the little ones want to be home with your kids. And I just want to go home and give them a hug. And... Uh, you are so blessed and just take care of your kids but I started to write this as I never called you by your name to me for three years you have only been known as the shooter and I will never call you by your name because you are just the shooter until I found out you were the executioner of my daughter you didn't shoot her, you executed my daughter for absolutely no reason in the world. So I am going to start to read what I was hoping that I would be able to read. I was going to pass it up, but I can't pass up this opportunity. You know, we often hear people say, that they just live a normal life. Well, let me tell you, executioner, our lives have been anything but normal for three years and 57 days. Three years and 57 days we have lived this. No answers. Why? So I'm here to tell you that your life also has been anything but normal for also three years and 57 days. Your life, I pray, someday soon will end one way or another. And if you received the ultimate your life, Mr. Executioner, would end peacefully, unlike my daughter's, Dr. Hatcher. You chose to end her life. For what, besides drug and prostitution money? Oh, God. Lord, help me. Strong words from the victim's mother during the sentencing phase of this particular proceeding. Let's dial back now to how prosecutors made their argument for the penalty phase. What the defendant did was he volunteered to kill a perfect stranger. The last thing she ever saw in her life was that. She saw the face of evil with a gun pointed at her. You know that this is a career criminal who spent his entire life, even beginning as a juvenile, doing what he wants to do. Burglaries, robberies, aggravated assaults, car theft, gun charges. Look at the types of crimes he's committed. It's all about benefiting himself. 
It's all about how can he do things that hurt others that benefit himself. And what does that prove to you? That he has no regard for anybody else. None. All of his crimes prove that. This crime is just a culmination of all that. He volunteered. He wanted to kill another human being. He wanted to do it for a few hundred bucks and some drugs. In an unsuccessful attempt to try to save their client's life, the defense called the defendant's mother to the stand earlier. He's been spending a lot of time on the phone with me, with Casey, all of us, talking to us about he doesn't want us here and embarrassed for something that he did. He's always taken full responsibility for the things that he's done. He hadn't blamed anybody, and he doesn't want us to see us go through all of this. Ms. Love, is it, can you tell the jury the uh, impact that uh, his actions had upon your family? It's been devastating. Nobody can get any sleep. Nobody can eat. We've all been trying to be brave for each other, and it's hard. It's really hard. For all the times that Chris has been incarcerated or in jail, I've never heard of him having any problems, anything. He's, Chris has always been very respectful. Bottom line, this is how it ended with a verdict sending the defendant to the execution chamber, in essence. Former prosecutor Mike Korobanix is with me here for some analysis on this case. Now, Mike, look, we had a sympathetic victim. We had a ton of testimony from co-conspirators that this was all planned out, and this is how it ended, as I said. You know, you sometimes wonder, really, what is justice? Because all the punishment that the system can dole out is really never going to give any solace to this family and you see the mother of the defendant who is really like talk about no control over the situation is it's just horrific all the way around you know there's an old saying about sin harming so many layers of people and i think that this case gives us an example of the number of families and friends left grieving because of this sinister plot it it, it is almost unbelievable that the sinister plot was really amongst three people and all these multitude of innocent people whose lives have changed because of those three. And again, today the jury hand, handing down that recommendation for a death sentence for that particular defendant. Let's move on to another case we're covering now. Day two of testimony in a murder trial against an Iowa man facing murder charges over the death of his own four-month-old child. Authorities found the body of infant Sterling Keene rotted and infested with maggots. A medical examiner said the little boy died because his parents simply stopped caring for him. 28-year-old Zachary Keene faces murder and child neglect charges. A medical examiner said the child died from a, quote, failure to provide critical care. The child's mother, Cheyenne Harris, will be tried separately on the same charges. Keene appeared upset in court as prosecutors played a 911 call where he said his girlfriend checked on the child and found him dead. He said in that call that maybe the child died of sudden infant death syndrome. However, Keene later talked about a, in a recorded conversation that he arrived home that day from work and crashed. He said his girlfriend woke him up and told him that Sterling was dead. So a couple different stories there. Keene said he was disoriented during that conversation. One critical witness for the defense today was a social services worker who testified about the child's mother's drug use. Based on your position as a child protective worker, what does the presence of methamphetamine in a baby's umbilical cord mean? It means that the mother used methamphetamine during her pregnancy. If an infant is born with an illegal substance such as methamphetamine in their body, that's grounds for DHS intervention, isn't it? It is if it's reported to the hotline, yes. Were you able to determine whether or not there had actually been a referral to a social worker for this family? 
Can you clarify when you say social worker, are you referring to an agency, a hospital? I need you to repeat the question. Were you able to determine during your investigation whether there had ever actually been a referral made? A referral made to where? I guess I'm confused by your question. To a social worker. Was the, was the report that this family would be referred for social work ever followed up on to your knowledge? Specifically, no. A lot of shifty answers there, but look, a parade of first responders testified about finding little Sterling's lifeless body in a child's swing. He was staring. He had a, his eyes were open and he was a blank stare. His pupils were fixed and dilated. Pupils sh should kind of sometimes move and his didn't. And he never blinked, he never, and so then you go ahead and you do, you know, your assessment on, on the child. Um, I went down to uh, look, listen, and feel, breathing wise, basic, basic life support. Uh, he wasn't breathing, checked his brachial, brachial pulse. His arm was cold and stiff, and he had what appeared to be blood around his, on the side of his mouth. My assessment is this, this is, this is not a baby who, I can do CPR on. That witness and a responding police officer testified about the stench and the bugs and even how they recognized the swing that the dead child was sitting in. The first thing that I could smell was human urine. Urine, you said? Yes. Anything else that you could smell? I could smell, um, when I got closer to baby, I could smell, um, I guess the only way to describe it is death. Um, the body has started to, to do what it does when um, they're no longer living. I also, when I was down on baby's level, I could smell um, different, different scents, um, which later turned out to be candles, or uh, like a candle type, um, I guess, uh, air pressure. The first thing I noticed about the swing was that I, as a parent, had the, had the exact same model, and the swing was left in the on position. Other first responders also struggled to make sense of what they saw. I was startled by how tiny, how small he appeared to me. Now, I'm not a doctor, and I don't, but um, you could see every rib, um, and his, he was just very skinny arms and legs. Um, didn't look at all normal, like a, what you'd expect to see with a baby. And it was, he, he looked bad before, when, before we got the clothing off and stuff, but once we got down, he, it's really small. Tough testimony there for law enforcement. Look, a medical investigator who responded to the scene said that rigor mortis had fully set in, and that witness also testified to other disturbing details. Did the child have um, blankets covering him? Yes. Did you touch them? Yes. And what did they feel like? Wet. Was there anything else unusual that you saw around the child? Um, there was uh, flies and gnats. Let's take a look back now to the prosecution's opening statement from yesterday. Take a look at the face of the judge as the prosecutor describes what was happening in this case. This defendant, this father, whose responsibility it was to care for little Sterling, failed in his responsibilities. He directly caused Sterling's death. He was left in the same diaper for at least nine, maybe 14 days. He was left in that diaper full of stool, such that it attracted bugs, flies that laid their eggs in that diaper which eggs hatched into maggots while Sterling was alive. 
and those maggots were in his clothes and in his diaper, feeding on the feces in his diaper. And he laid in that room in that diaper between 9 and 14 days. And the evidence will show that that stool in his diaper irritated his skin such that it ruptured the skin and his bodily fluids came out. Malnutrition, dehydration, infection caused by diaper rash. That's what caused this child's death. And ladies and gentlemen, the evidence will show that this defendant, the father of that child, is responsible for that death. That was the promise of what the prosecution hoped it would prove in this case. The defense, however, cautioned jurors not to rush to judgment. Then the defense said this was a tragedy, not a crime. This case is about the death of a child. Nothing anybody says throughout this trial is going to soften that. It's a terrible thing. The problem is, of course, that a tragedy like this creates a gut reaction in us. We want to punish them. There's an automatic tendency to what we refer to as rush to judgment. As jurors, it is your responsibility, it is your job not to do that. This is a tragedy, but not a crime. And we're going to ask you to return a verdict of not guilty. Sadly, what prosecutors say happened to Sterling Keene is not an isolated incident. In 2014, some 1,580 children died as a result of abuse and neglect. That's between four and five children each day. Some have described child abuse as an epidemic. Every year, 3.6 million referrals are made to child protection agencies. Those referrals involved a total of 6.6 .6 million children. Joining me tonight again for more analysis, former prosecutor, current defense attorney, Mike Korobanics. Mike, the defendant's associates say he was using methamphetamine, cocaine, sometimes smoked weed. That might explain how he had apparently no clue that his infant son was dead in his house, but does it mount a defense to murder charges? I think it's a very difficult defense. I think the emotions of this case, I mean, you know, you saw one of the police officers, I mean, he was a deputy chief, I think it said there. I mean, someone with that much experience comes on a stand, and this case is so volatile and vile, he starts crying on the stand. I think they have a tough road to hoe, and I don't think that amounts to much of a defense. Yeah, very quickly here, you know, the defense is using this tactic of blaming social services for not properly acting on a report. We saw some shifty cross-examination of that social services witness there. Effective strategy? Well, not really, because I think people are really looking at this case. When you start, maybe something to, to take off from the defendant, but to blame the people who are trying to protect people is really not a good move here. I agree with that assessment. Still ahead tonight on the Daily Debrief, who killed convicted mobster Whitey Bulger in prison? Speculation is mounting about whether Bulger was murdered. Plus, a new indictment against the man accused of murdering 11 members of a Jewish synagogue in Pittsburgh. Wait till you hear the number of years he might face in prison. That's when we return tonight. New details are emerging tonight about the death of convicted mobster James Whitey Bulger. Bulger died yesterday shortly after transfer to a new federal prison in West Virginia. We're going to show you a list here of charges and convictions which sent him there. Bottom line, unofficial reports suggest that Bulger was murdered. The Boston Globe says this man may be connected to Bulger's death. However, he has not been charged. He's described by the Boston Globe as a mafia hitman and a career criminal. Prosecutors have announced new charges against the man accused of mass murder at a Pittsburgh Jewish synagogue. Robert Bowers now stands indicted of 44 separate counts. If he's convicted, he could face either the death penalty or a life sentence plus 535 years in prison. 
Eleven worshipers died in that attack. The new charges include obstructing the free exercise of religion and related murder and weapons charges. Now for other incidents making headlines, here is Anthony Velez. Here are today's top crime stories trending on longcrime.com and across the country. Kyle Loletta, the backup quarterback for the New York Giants, was arrested after nearly running over a police officer in New Jersey. The 23-year-old rookie is accused of recklessly driving his car while traveling to the team's practice facility in East Rutherford, allegedly almost running over an officer after ignoring that officer's instructions. Loletta now faces charges of eluding police and resisting arrest. A Rutgers College football player was arrested after authorities uncovered his plan to murder family members of an acquaintance. 23-year-old Isaiah Bullock of Piscataway, New Jersey, faces two counts of attempted first-degree murder and conspiracy for the alleged plot to kill. Bullock was immediately dismissed from Rutgers football team, and the university has initiated disciplinary proceedings. Prosecutors in Miami filed a letter in federal court claiming package bomb suspect Caesar Sayak had planned his mail bombing spree back in July. Sayak is accused of mailing over a dozen pipe bombs to prominent Democrats and critics of President Trump, such as the news giant CNN. None of the suspected package bombs exploded. Sayak was arrested in Miami and now faces five federal charges, including mailing explosives. Those were today's top crime stories. I'm Anthony Velez for The Daily Debrief. Former prosecutor, current criminal defense attorney Mike Korobanix joins us one last time. So, Mike, look, this guy's been planning this thing since July. That's the accusation that came out today. Prosecutors have his DNA. They've got partial fingerprints on at least one package. This is a strong case. They've got some goods on this guy. Seems like a very, very strong case. And, you know, listen, like I always say, you're dealing with the FBI. This is the government who put a man on the moon. And in a case like this, they had their A-team on this. I mean, two days and they caught him. I mean, you had agents from multiple states involved in this thing. They, they went after this guy very, very quickly. This was a fast arrest. It was a fast investigation across multiple jurisdictions. Well, like I said, and the people who are working on this in, in, in jurisdictions were all on scholarship. They're the top of the top, the <laughs> forensic guys. On scholarship, that's one way to put it. Mike Kurabanix, appreciate your insight here on The Daily Debrief. Always appreciate being here. Thank you for having me. We're going to wrap up the broadcast day here on The Daily Debrief with a hope that you will join us starting tomorrow at about 9 a.m. when the Law and Crime Network will be streaming a number of the trials that we discussed earlier on in the broadcast. Meantime, we will keep our eye on the other top crime headlines of the day. From all of us at Law and Crime and at The Daily Debrief, this is Aaron Keller. Have a good evening. We'll see you tomorrow.